حبك يا لبنان عشرين عشرين وجود التسيير مهمة رئيس الحكومة إن هذه المعادلة المصر قد ماتت على يد حزب الله بالذات We are prepared to strike whenever we choose Good afternoon on this Friday, September 6th. I'm Yumna Naufal and these are today's headlines. ABC News political director reclined comments on the Syrian crisis live from Washington, D.C. Syrian rebels seize an entry to a Christian town and they claim they have withdrawn to protect religious and archaeological sites. The Higher Defense Council lauds the role of security forces in arresting criminals in Lebanon. World leaders gathered at the G20 summit in the Russian city of St. Petersburg failed to settle their differences over the U.S. push for military action against Syria in the wake of an alleged chemical attack. The first day of the summit on Thursday was overshadowed by the conflict as President Barack Obama tried to garner international support for the military campaign amid Russian opposition. In New York, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, says there is no doubt that Washington has given up trying to work with the U.N. Security Council over the attack. She said there was no viable path forward in the Security Council and accuses Russia of holding it hostage. Beyond convincing Russia, Obama has a tough sell ahead elsewhere. China, another veto-wielding Security Council member, has already expressed its grave concerns over unilateral military strikes. And the U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon later told the leaders at the summit that any military action must have the Security Council's backing. Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, said that they cannot accept U.S. proofs of chemical weapons used in Syria, and they are far from being convincing, he said. On the line with us live from Washington, D.C., is political director of ABC News, Rick Klein. Can you hear me, Rick? I hear you, yes. Rick, what is the situation like right now in Capitol Hill? It is a tough sell for President Obama. He has asked the, the Congress to go along with his plans to, uh, to, uh, to, to go ahead with a military strike in Syria, and he does not have the votes right now. Uh, the, the Senate is looking difficult. In the House of Representatives, a majority has told us that they're opposed to military action in Syria, uh, and that would make any passage of a resolution impossible. So. Barring uh, the president being able to change some hearts and minds in the coming days, uh, he would not be able to get the authorization that he's seeking to go ahead with the military strike. Is, there, is, the, is, the, is the probability that he will get congressional approval or not? Well, he's still got, uh, he's got time to make the case. Uh, and, and I think most folks still believe that, uh, that there's too much on the line for the president for it to be possible that he not get it. But he is losing the PR battle around it right now. He is, uh, there are town halls going on around the country where members of Congress are hearing almost unanimously from their constituents that they don't want military action in Syria. That's the backdrop. That makes it a hard case to make. So uh, I think people still presume that somehow he will get the authorization he's seeking because there is so much on the line. But it's not clear how, how that happens, how we get from point A to point B. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee this week passed a resolution allowing the use of force against Syria over the August chemical weapons attack. Now, albeit with restrictions and more votes are expected, do you expect an answer or an attack to happen next week, or could this take more time? I think it's going to take more time. I think uh, at, the, at the best case scenario, the best case timeline for the president would be that the Senate votes next week, the House most likely not to vote until the week after. So I don't think that. Uh, any, uh, any potential attack could happen for at least a few weeks at this point. Rick, a lot of analysts that are talking about this and writing about this say, well, does the president know that in the limited military strike that he's supposed to, that's supposed to take place, he's actually fighting on the side of al-Qaeda? Can you comment on that? Well, I think that one of the concerns that um, the members of Congress have raised is that uh, it's hard to define the Syrian opposition. And that, 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 that right now, the Assad opposition includes elements of al-Qaeda. So if you're weakening Assad, are you strengthening al-Qaeda? That is a, a legitimate and, and real concern that's being voiced right now. And I think everything that's happening now in American politics is, uh, is colored by the memories of the Iraq war and the fact that... Uh, that we had the faulty intelligence on the front end and that we weren't prepared right. for the reaction on the back end. And I think that 
that, that experience uh, has a lot of folks in Congress skeptical about um, how easy and how, how quickly right. the operation Right. I mean, about the Iraq War, they went in claiming there were weapons of mass destruction and afterwards said, well, we were wrong. And right now, as it stands today, does Obama have proof 100% that it was Assad's fault, the chemical weapons attack? No, and, and they're not saying that they have 100 percent proof. Uh, the Secretary well, can Kerry they, has can they, not. can they, but they can still launch a military strike without 100 percent proof. Uh, I mean, I, are you asking me a legal question, or are you asking me a practical? No, question? practical That's question. We'll get, we'll get the lawyers on that one. Sure. I mean, uh, as a practical matter, the way that Secretary Kerry has cast this is that uh, if you were prosecuting a case, the case would be beyond a reasonable doubt, and he believes that they have a case beyond a reasonable doubt, based on the fact that there is no question that Assad has chemical weapons, that there are stockpiles, based on the locations where these attacks took place, based on the damage that happened there, based on the capabilities and, and who had command and control of the weapons. Uh, they, they don't believe that there's any serious case that can be mounted that, uh, that suggests that it was someone other than the Assad regime. But what about the UN report then, the UN investigators that were on the ground to investigate the attack on August 21st? The report, well, according to them, is not going to come out for another two or three weeks. So isn't that even going to take a role in the, his decision, perhaps, and wait that long? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, I, I think that is, is going to be one element of the opposition to doing anything about this, is that uh, you don't have a UN report back yet. Um, the, the administration doesn't believe you need to wait for the United Nations, uh, the, the, but some of the president's critics, even at home, believe that uh, the right thing to do would at least be wait for the international community to come back and then decide how you're going to respond. Right. Here's my another question that everybody's asking is, people are always speculating about the consequences, right? They don't know. I mean, the American government is saying this will be a military strike, yet the consequences nobody is really sure of. What are you hearing in Washington about the possible repercussions of an attack like this? The possible repercussions uh, of an attack, I think there's concerns about what you're doing in the region. There's concerns about what the um, unintended consequences are uh, that you're, you're obviously getting involved in a civil war in a very volatile region. How is Israel impacted? How does Iran respond? How do the Syrians respond? How do the Jordanians respond? Right. Uh, well, let's the, talk the about let's talk about Iran and Israel for a second there. Could this be the the door to a possible Iran? How, how will Iran and Israel respond to this, do you think? I, I, I have no insight on that whatsoever. Uh, I, I mean, I know that uh, Israel has, is likely to stay out of any, uh, any direct uh, activity that's going on there, but if they're attacked, I'd imagine that they would respond, but I have no insight into that, and I, I certainly okay. have no insight into how the Iranians would respond. Okay. All right. Is there any fear in Washington that this could have, perhaps, that the Iranians could retaliate if Syria is attacked? I mean, we've heard the president of Iran be vocal about it and warn the United States against the attack. He, didn't, he said that there would be some grave consequences. Are they speculating in Washington about what those could be? Uh, not not in, in any degree of specificity, but in okay. the general sense uh, of uh, of you don't know what you once you get involved there you don't know what the response is going to be and it could be unanticipated it could be much more dangerous than you think um, and there's others that are making the opposite argument that that are saying that uh, if you don't respond to uh, the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons you're emboldening the Iranians you're emboldening the North Koreans you're sending a message to leaders around the world that the U.S.'s word and commitment to upholding international standards doesn't matter. So, so no matter uh, what, he the, has to respond, right? No matter what yeah, now, well, there has to be some form of response. That's the argument that's being put forward, is that to not respond would be a sign of, of weakness and a sign that the United States is not making good on its word. Okay. What do you expect? Congress is resuming on September 9th. Do you, expect the, do you expect a vote next week, or do you expect maybe more deliberations? I mean, the president, from now till then, he has about three days, the whole weekend, and we've been hearing that he's been very active, him as well as U.S., uh, as well as Kerry, as John Kerry, they've been very vocal and they've been really lobbying to try to get everybody on their side. How's that looking right now? I think that we're likely to see a vote in the Senate next week. Uh, I also think we're likely to see the president address the nation in some public forum from the White House, maybe an Oval Office address, something along those lines, early in the week to try to build public support. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it's not clear that it's there right now, and that's, that's what the President's challenge is going to be, to try to convince the people, try to convince the Congress that this is something that needs to be done. He's got three days to do that. Do you think he'll be able to do that? Um, I, think, uh, I think he 
right now, three days is not actually describing fully what's going on. Once they're back, that's not the same as, as actually voting on it. And the vote could be delayed. The vote could be late in the week. Uh, so I don't think it's I don't think the time frame is quite the way you describe it. But I think you have a little more flexibility, but it, it's still going to be difficult. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us today. That was political director of ABC News, Rick Klein. We're going to have to talk to you again some other time. Thank you. Coming up next, Ambassador David Hale's personal introductory video message to the people of Lebanon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Syrian rebels who seized an entry to a Christian town north of Damascus this week have now withdrawn to protect religious and archaeological sites there. Pre-Syrian army units on Wednesday destroyed posts at Maloula and Jabadin. On Wednesday also, the Britain-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said jihadist fighters of the Al-Nusra Front seized a military post at Maloula after a suicide attack. It said regime warplanes later launched three air raids on the checkpoint taken by Islamists. Maloula is a symbol of the Christian presence in Syria and many of its inhabitants speak Aramaic, the language spoken by Jesus Christ that only small scattered communities around the world still use today. In Lebanon, the Higher Defense Council lauds the role of security forces and the army in arresting criminals as it is briefed on measures put in place to defend diplomatic missions and confront a bigger refugee influx from Syria. Top officials were briefed by security and military officials on the arrest of criminals and called for doubling their efforts to do so. Higher Defense Council Secretary General, Magistro General Mohamed Khair said following a meeting led by President Michel Slaiman that they also discussed the issue of Syrian refugees and the possibility of a bigger influx amid threats of the U.S. military strike on the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad over the alleged use of chemical weapons on August 21st. Caretaker Social Affairs Minister Wael Abu Faoud describes a meeting in Geneva on Syrian refugees as disappointing, but he expressed hope that another conference in New York could find solutions to Lebanon's woes. Abu Faoud said his participation in the latest Geneva meeting was an opportunity to reiterate that Lebanon was carrying the biggest burden of refugees with the minimum assistance compared to other countries. He described international cooperation with the Lebanese authorities as disappointing and warned that Lebanon would face a bigger crisis if an immediate solution was not found. So far, only 27% of the financial needs have been met, according to him. Lebanese security forces tightened security around the U.S. Embassy in Aoukar, north of Beirut, ahead of a planned rally to protest the possible U.S. strike against Syria. The security measures will cover a radius of 700 meters starting from Aoukar's main square all the way up to the embassy. This comes as a new U.S. ambassador to Lebanon is welcomed in, in the country. David Hale's video in his introduction here. <laughs> Anna David Hale, a Safir al Ameriki al Jadid fi Lubnan. I've been a diplomat for almost 30 years, promoting peace in the Middle East and strengthening Arab American relations. Lebanon and its people have been part of my life for decades, ever since my grandparents visited in the 1960s. They told me stories of your beautiful country with its towering cedars. One of my professors here at Georgetown University served as President John F. Kennedy's ambassador to Lebanon. Professor Armin Meyer opened my eyes to Lebanon's potential and I began my lifelong involvement in the Middle East. After I joined the State Department, I was assigned to Beirut just after the tragic civil war ended and Lebanon lay in ruins. But I returned during a brighter time, and the country began to rebuild and the stirrings of real democracy re-emerged. During this period, I too matured and was deeply affected by what I saw and learned from the Lebanese people. Walking through the busy streets of Washington, D.C., I think of how Beirut was reborn and how Lebanon has regained its energy and dynamism. You've worked to restore true independence, unity, prosperity, stability, and security throughout the whole country. You're building strong state institutions, accountable to all Lebanese. This work is far from complete. The American people will remain your partners in this effort, because we share those goals. I hope you'll visit the Embassy's Facebook page and share your ideas on how we can work together. It was 25 years ago when I first set foot in Lebanon. Ever since then, the Lebanese people have played a big role in my life. Saud Kariba Nila Lebanon. This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our top stories. ABC News political director Rick Klein commented on the Syrian crisis live from Washington, D.C. Syrian rebels seized an entry to a Christian town they claim they withdrew from to protect religious and archaeological sites.
And the Higher Defense Council lauds the role of security forces in arresting criminals in the country. Those are your Friday headlines live on Future Television in Beirut. I'm Yimna Nelfan, wishing you a good weekend. Good night. We are prepared to strike whenever we choose.